So my name is Mark Tolan. I'm a, I'm an architect, uh, professor, uh, building technology uh, expert, and uh, I have been building all my life. And um, I just finished a stint teaching in teaching architecture and and building technology in China. And uh, I am back in Canada. Um, I'm currently in Quebec, Canada. And uh, just as Patrick was uh, showing beautiful tropical plants in his background, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not in the, I, it would be so beautiful to have uh, my, my perfect background here, but I don't. <laughs> um, it, it's uh, ice and snow and the, apparently the, there are seals on the river. I haven't seen them yet, but uh, I, I will get there at some point. Um, so I'm in the, in the other extreme, uh, not in South America, but uh, northernmost Canada. Um, so, uh, I want to talk today a bit about, uh, technology, uh, about my research. And, uh, I have also been fortunate to have worked on a school bus conversion just, uh, this year or, or last year. Um, so a little bit of everything. However, um, even though this is a tiny house expo, I, uh, I actually have, uh, I know of tiny houses, houses, and I know Darcy very well, and he will speak later. Um, but uh, I personally have never built a tiny house, so house. So I hope that uh, you're still inspired by uh, some of the work that I do. So as an architect, uh, quickly, I'm just going to jump into one house that I have designed. Only going to show you a section. I'm always sustainable. Um, I think sustainability is an imperative. Um, it, it must be uh, part of, um, of our existence. But we also have to see it very carefully, very, very carefully, because there is um, there's a lot of greenwashing. There's a lot of things, you know, where people say, oh, you got to, this is the most amazing thing, and this is the greenest technology on the planet. And then you find out, oh, wait a minute, it's just like the curly fluorescent light bulb that we had for a couple of years that they pushed on us. And then we realized, oh, that's actually pretty toxic and uh, not so good. So we finally ended up with the LEDs that we have now. So we have to carefully um, think about what we're doing. And um, critical thinking is important. And talking about critical thinking, I'm I'm here as a as an educator, um, also as a as a business person. I, I have started my own prefabrication uh, business. Um, it is in its infancy. I'm not there where I have prototypes sitting somewhere. Well, I have I have one prototype now, but I'm mostly an educator, and uh, I'm trying to uh, build up this uh, prefabrication um, uh, company as well. So, an educator. I also teach with the Canadian Centre for Learning. I'm a founding member. On the bottom there, you can see that Canadian Centre for Learning. Of course, it is spelled R-E, and it's devastating because you want to try to put in E-R for the American spelling, and of course, you don't get anywhere, but it's Canadian Centre for Learning.ca. So um, sustainability. Um, all of my projects that I have uh, designed are always looking at some angle of uh, sustainability. Sometimes it's more difficult, too, because it does it always costs a tiny bit more to be sustainable. Unfortunately, it does because the convention is cheaper. So um, this house is very innovative. It has uh, gray water recycling, rainwater recycling, uh, green roof, um, active passive solar. And I'll, I'll briefly talk in, in one second about active and passive solar. It does have geothermal. Um, it does um, have um, a solar solar components, um, but uh, the solar components are fairly minimal. Um, it's not um, on the bottom there. I also talk about solar hydronics. Uh, there is no solar hydronics, um, only solar electric uh, systems within this house. Um, and this is uh, for a client. Now, when I work for myself, um, I have uh, planned something for myself, but it had actually never, it never crystallized because the building permit issues. Um, I'm, I had uh, conceptualized this in Toronto, Canada. They're loosening systems everywhere around the world a little bit for for tiny homes, for 
uh, garden suites, for laneway suites. Um, but this was actually pre um, the loosening of the, the permit uh, issues. So I did not get a permit for this structure, but I built something else instead. But this structure is still very innovative and, uh, and quite amazing. Um, as it is a uh, kind of a passive house design, I wanted to use uh, um, aerated autoclaved concrete, which is a unique material, which is a very porous, a lightweight uh, material, very porous material, but you get an incredible R value out of the structure. And I wanted to use uh, something that uh, is, uh, I think, one of the most powerful um, devices or, or energy devices that exist, um, solar hydronic components. Um, I've worked with solar hydronic before, and it is absolutely incredible how even in Canada, at minus, uh, what is it, minus 40 is the same, right? Minus 40 Celsius and minus 40 Fahrenheit is actually the same. I'm up here in northern Quebec. We have occasionally minus 40 and everything freezes as you walk outside. Everything, like you got to protect yourself. Um, but you can use uh, solar evacuated tubes and actually create energy um, and heat. Um, so they're the most effective um, devices. And uh, for this place in Toronto, it was envisioned to have solar um, evacuated tubes on the, on the roof. And... Uh, I do promote something that I call a dumb home. Um, on the bottom there, there's active passive houses, net zero houses, energy plus houses, smart homes and dumb homes. Whenever I, I see somebody talk about smart technologies, I, I always question, critically think about, is it right, is it wrong? Um, sometimes I think a dumb home is better because if you have incredible smart technology that senses the temperature outside, that senses your temperature, that senses everything, senses um, um, or, or is connected to a cell phone system, connected to the internet, there will always be issues with it. And I have, I've done a lot of electronic work as well. And I typically found that just like a cell phone, you throw it away after so many years because it's no longer working. And uh, I'm actually, I do have some situations in houses that I have designed where the systems don't work after so many years. So I am actually promoting the dumb home. Um, smart home is good and beautiful, but the dumb home that will always work is better. So this house was supposed to only have some ball valves, a seasonal geothermal storage. You're producing a lot of heat in the, uh, in the summer um, and a little bit of heat in the winter. And with that, you uh, store it under the building and then simply by opening ball valves, you control where you send the heat. If you send it into the ground as a seasonal storage, because you can actually heat up the ground underneath your building, bring it back into your floor when you need it. And in-floor heating is actually the best, the best type of heating that you can possibly imagine. Um, you can be cooler around your body or your head. As long as your feet are warm, you are in, uh, in the perfect uh, position. But um, yeah, this this uh, just wanted to quickly touch on active passive. You know, being being a, a building technology professor, um, a passive design is basically when you leave the house as is and everything kind of works through solar energy or uh, possible shading. However, um, the active part is when you actively start shading or actively uh, do something. So an active house. Um, allows you to open up certain windows and adjust certain things, whereas a passive house is just purely, it's almost like a, an animal that goes into the ground, and I do have the next slide for that. Um, net zero is, of course, when you, when you don't uh, use any extra energy, so you can actually pull in energy, but maybe during the daytime you, you bring electricity into the city while you are at work, so that's kind of considered a net zero house. Energy plus is then when you actually produce way more energy than you actually use. But um, we have we have really lost a lot of ability um, that or or smartness that animals have. Um, the rabbit goes into the ground, um, and in the winter, when it's uh, extremely cold outside, 
it is beautifully warm in in the in the den and in the summer the uh, reversal is true so this system of course works due to thermal mass the thermal mass of the earth and uh, that's something that it's difficult for a tiny home to achieve a thermal mass uh, because you don't want extra weight necessarily in a tiny home uh, but uh, knowing some of those principles is uh, important and uh, we we can only learn from nature um, so when you have a thermal mass solar uh, sunlight can heat that thermal mass up and uh, nighttime you can cruise through the night and uh, these are some principles that are being used uh, in in moderate climates i mean of course when you are in an extremely cold climate very very cold climate it is difficult and if you're in extremely hot climates, you just want to shield yourself from the sun. You do not want to create um, uh, any uh, thermal intake in the inside uh, of your building. But uh, and on the bottom there, the three houses, one more time, we used to heat with, with uh, wood and open flame. It's really inefficient. You're just, your windows were drafty. You would just get the draft into the house and then blow all the heat out of the chimney. So we are now in the in the moment where a lot of people are working on smart homes and they have hundreds of technologies like pumps and systems and electrical and solar. Um, and I have seen this actually in my own houses when I make them too complex. The client is actually complaining. He says, he's, he, we, we put geothermal in there and all of a sudden the electrical cost is higher than the, the previous gas cost that they used to have. So um it has to be done very careful and you have to put timers on these pumps on the circulation pumps and so on and so forth so that they don't run all the time um so it's a tricky one to create a smart home that is actually really really good so i do promote simple passive or active and dumb homes where it's very very minimal and that whole system you know can also uh, be applied to tiny homes it's it's a, a more difficult but um Alternatives to alternatives to uh, air conditioning, of course, is shading. Um, using the solar heat gain in the winter with with thermal mass is uh, important. If you have a black uh, ceramic floor, for example, of course, you get a better a better heat up um, as opposed to having um, a white one or having a very light carpet floor, for example. That doesn't really pick up any heat. Insulation is uh, is important. Um, uh, and there, there are environmental choices as well. I, I put spray foam in brackets. I'm not necessarily a fan of spray foam. It's extremely tight and gives you an incredible insulation, but I'm personally not necessarily a fan of spray foam because of off-gassing, because of fire hazards. Um, I am a fan of rock sole insulation. Um, I do, like if you have um, allergies, for example, um, or, or allergic to dust, um, then I would recommend cellulose uh, or wool insulation. But rock sole is one of the most amazing insulations there that does exist. Um, for tiny homes, make sure that everything stays simple, as simple as possible. So when, I, when you look back at the, you can probably, probably build a, a smart tiny home or, or a very smart school bus with a lot of technology, but, um, it does help to try to be more efficient and uh, as simple as possible. Like use only one or two sources. So like propane is an amazing source uh, because you can always fill it up um, or produce your own uh, uh, solar 12 volt. Um, that's, uh, those are the two most important uh, components that you should use. Um, and I, I do like to, refer back when I, whenever I do design, I do like to refer back to people who are visionary people in, in this world. Um, Steve Baer um, is one of them in California or Arizona. Um, he's still around uh, and uh, he was visionary in 1980s when he went out into the desert and started building his, uh, his buildings. A lot of people, a lot of hippies, a lot of uh, uh, Vietnam deny or not let's say deniers or 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 people that didn't want to serve you know they disappeared into the into the desert. Um, Michael Reynolds 
if you are interested in uh, in his work, like Earth Ships, um, Passive House Design. Um, Mike Reynolds is also another um, architect who he actually lost his license over the stuff that he did in the in the desert because he he started building subdivisions and and uh, larger complexes of uh, of structures. And uh, who was he was sued by the um, Architect Association of uh, America, I guess, um, and lost his license over all of the stuff that he has done. But two very visionary people. Um, so Steve Baer had um, this first active solar house in Arizona, um, low tech oil drums filled with water and a beautiful wall that uh, pops up and down. Um, so in, in the nighttime, it gets cold in the desert. During the day, it's uh, it's very warm. Um, heating up that water in these oil barrels was uh, his way of uh, heating the house and then closing it in the nighttime. Um, there is something called the Newfoundland Furnace. Newfoundland is an incredible uh, province here in Canada um, with uh, incredible people. Uh, and one person up there in, uh, envisioned and developed the Newfoundland Furnace it's basically pop cans drilled out top and bottom, painted black, put in between a glass layer and then mounted to the side of your house. You got air intake um, uh, on, on the bottom, air exhaust of warm air at the top, and uh, you have free heat. Um, so it's basically a cheap version of uh, evacuated tubes. But um, uh, I want to get into my own research. And uh, as much as... Uh, I, I do enjoy, you know, the the movement of of the hippies into the into the desert, doing all kinds of crazy wacky stuff back then, um, by uh, negating what was going on in the world. Um, I do appreciate using incredible technology, incredible innovation. It it could be low tech, um, low tech but high tech at the same time, uh, just like this this vehicle and. Burning Man, of course, all of you guys probably know there's pros and cons about Burning Man. And I actually should probably open the question and answer. My apologies. Um, and uh, <laughs> passive homes for active people and active homes for passive people. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Roxol, Roxol insulation. Roxol, just as it sounds, it's made out of uh, mineral rock. Um, it's spun fiber out of rock. And uh, it is much denser than fiberglass insulation. I'm not necessarily a fan of fiberglass. Everybody knows fiberglass pink and the pink panther because it's a nice advertisement. But the fiberglass insulation is more porous as opposed to the Roxol insulation. So Roxol has the nicest um, R value to, to mass. It is amazing because it, uh, it is a fire retardant. It, uh, it doesn't absorb any moisture. Uh, so it's mineral mineral based. But um, coming to my own research now, and I'll try to uh, stay in in uh, on schedule here. Need to forward. Um, a few years ago, I came across a company in Canada that uh, started has, has a patented system. It uh, it's kind of metal Velcro. We call it metal Velcro. We're not allowed to call it metal Velcro because 3M um, has the copyright on the term Velcro. Uh, but the company is a couple of uh, tool and die makers and engineers that have come up with a very innovative way of putting brake pads to brake shoes. Instead of riveting it, they uh, they use this metal Velcro technique of um, uh, scratching fine microscopic hairs into the metal and then imprint, imprinting the uh, the brakes um, from the shoe to the pad together. Uh, very innovative. Um, and uh, I was uh, I was tasked with, uh, and I like the material, and I was tasked with the idea of trying to make structures and buildings out of this. And uh, we have managed to, um, as a university project with a bunch of students, to create an extremely innovative structure called the steam canoe, which uh, was the first metal Velcro or grip metal building ever built and conceived. Now the technology slowly comes into cross-laminated timbers. 
that um, it was a very innovative project that uh, won multiple awards in in Germany and the U.S. and uh, and Canada for woodworking and building technology. It also had evacuated tubes because I'm always trying to be sustainable, or economical, or try to um, show what is possible in this world. Uh, the idea, and this is where the term steam comes from, it's actually fog. There's a tank in the back of this building, and this was built in February, minus 20 Celsius, so that's, I think, minus 10, minus 15 Fahrenheit um, at the lake shore of, uh, of Toronto. And uh, it, uh, the evacuated tubes were heating the water or the snow that was supposed to be in the back of this tank and emitting a fog or a steam uh, from this structure, like like an animal um, on a pasture in the winter. Um, the structure was made out of this press laminated material. And uh, we we were um, very fortunate to have uh, been able to, to use this material in collaboration with the industry, created something that is very unique. Um, we actually didn't need any structure. We first put structure in there, but we realized we didn't need any structure. So we could only use the panel um, as uh, an instantly pressed um, panel. And uh, we explored all kinds of options of making curved panels, straight panels. We now have perfected this system. We can now make uh, ultimately any, sh any shape out of this, any curved shape. And uh, I have taken this further now and have created tiny, tiny homes, uh, 10 square meters or 100, 108 square feet. And I think many jurisdictions, states, provinces allow um, a 100 square foot. Many places are now at 150 square foot or even 200 square foot homes, as long as they don't have plumbing in there. That's, so that's a, that's a very delicate issue. And the way how I go around that um, to not have plumbing is I just do a garden hose connection. So it's summer only. Um, yeah, the barb there, it's now 160 in Ontario. Absolutely correct. Um, it is 15 square meters in metric for Canada. And that equates uh, 160 um, square feet. Um, and uh, so... Sorry, I was just looking at the questions. So this structure is uh, extremely innovative. Again, it also used solar, uh, solar hydronic, uh, solar electric. Um, it is a brand new system that uh, is in the passive house system, two skin system. And uh, I'm not as far as the previous presenter. Sorry, I lost your name. Um, and I'm not as far as, uh, as uh, Patrick in the first uh, presentation. We're we're just the egg right now. We we don't have the chicken yet. We're just the egg. We're breeding, and uh, we're hoping to uh, to hatch very soon. Um, but uh, our structure is um, there. We have different systems. We have uh, prefabricated square systems. We have this system. Uh, this system can actually be loaded onto a truck and uh, in in three components onto the back of a pickup truck and then assembled on site um, in individual slices. And you can add as many slices as you are legally allowed, whether it's 100 square feet or 160 square feet, 200 square feet. I do know some jurisdictions allow the 200 um, in, in the States. Um, so this is all made out of the veneer lumber. There is only these banana connections, I call them banana pieces that are the structure. So there's no two by four wall, there's no two by six wall. Um, this wall construction is a thermal bridge. So if you don't have the thermal bridge, it's actually beneficiary um, for the, uh, the passive house situation. Um, so this, this uh, house is uh, currently in test phase. Um, we are trying to manufacture these, uh, these components. Um, and another square version, um, we looked at alternative versions that are a little bit more cost effective because cost is always an issue. And uh, so we made uh, a square box. Um, everybody knows container uh, houses. 
uh, we actually are in the situation where we we can adjust the size a little bit. And it, again, it comes into the shipping situation as well, uh, because as somebody else said before, you know, nine foot, 10 foot, you need a special convoy. Um, this one is actually eight foot in the inside. So the outside is actually um, eight foot and, uh, and six to, to nine foot in, uh, in width. So officially, when we transport these, uh, we actually have to stack them the other way. I did stack them this way. And uh, I actually was very lucky because when I drove this, um, the police pulled over a truck right in front of me and they didn't see me. <laughs> I was very, very lucky. But um, uh, this is the first shipment of uh, bringing it uh, into a site. And coming in slices, it is uh, beautiful that it can be carried into the inside. Now, these are unfinished slices. So we did finish this on site. Uh, here you see the final ascent, well, the first assembly wrapped up for, for rain um, and then slowly processing, um, closing it with facades. And again, this, this uh, project, similar to the, uh, to the 3D printed, um, um, to the 3D printed plastic project, um, the, the front, front and back are conventional and anything is possible from a very sophisticated high-end facade to a very, very inexpensive uh, way of closing it. Um, any, anything is possible. Um, inside furniture, uh, the inside finish is already up there. I do have some other images later. Um, and this shows one stage of the final um, situation. So again, this sink is purely a, uh, a water hose connection and just drains um, onto the onto the property. Um, and uh, the main thing, <laughs> you will always see my coffee machine. Um, I kind of live off that uh, substance. I, I came late to coffee drinking and maybe I have to make up for many, many years, but uh, I'm, I'm starting to enjoy coffee more and more. And uh, it's the central element. And of course, that's also why there is, there's a tiny little fridge um, and I'll show it in the video later. Uh, so coming back to uh, insulation, um, I see a quick question there on the heating of water. There's propane. Um, there's a propane hot water uh, tank that can do that. You can also get electric, but uh, very, very small under cabinet heaters. If you are connected to a house, you can do an underground connection too, but uh, the hot water will then run. <laughs> you gotta run it for five minutes before it gets hot. So that's not uh, economical. Quickly coming to uh, insulation again. Again, I'm I'm not a fan of the spray foam insulation. While even though it it actually in some jurisdictions you don't need the vapor barrier when you do spray foam, um, but uh, again the spray foam is not as natural as some of the other products that I like to use. I do like to use in underground situations or when you're in touch with the ground with the moisture. I do like to use the rigid foam insulation. You can see it here. The blue foam is in the ground. But as I go up, I always try to use the highest possible R value of uh, rock sole insulation. Um, then the vapor barrier goes on. And then the finish, just like in tiny houses, uh, you know, this house is supposed to be semi-movable. I could move it. And I want to bring it to a tiny house expo um, in the summer. Um, it can be cut into into half if necessary, but uh, drywall, of course, is not recommended uh, for for tiny homes necessarily because when you ship it, it will possibly crack, and then you got to finish it. So plywood is uh, is a great uh, great solution. You don't, and it's very quick. You don't have to tape the joints. You can make reveal joints. I used tile here. Probably should have put in the uh, the electric uh, in-floor heating. There was a moment where I wanted to have the radiant in-floor um, with hydronic uh, system on the outside, but um, everything is uh, economic and ecologic uh, choices. You always have to do the fine line between that. Um, and I'm currently in Quebec, so I'm not in Toronto. Otherwise, I would be broadcasting live uh, from this. So um, let me just run some of the videos that I shot um, off, uh, off the unit. The louvered wall is something that I kind of like. Uh, the, um, it's currently wrapped up for the winter. Um, there you have the fridge. You know, you gotta have your, your oat milk or your milk milk 
um, in in there to uh, to make your coffee. And it is actually going to be available on Airbnb at some point soon. Um, because uh, I do have, as somebody mentioned, I do have the washroom in the inside. So this this unit being 100 square feet did not need a building permit. Um, and I do have a separate washroom that is accessible from the back. Um, and uh, with that, this is completely Airbnb -able. Airbnb able interesting words. Okay. Um, micro switches, so you can adjust the uh, the lighting <clears throat> to um, white light, yellow light, blue light, red light. Um, the fridge actually, interestingly enough, acts as a reading light at night when you open the door. Uh, my daughter was kind of laughing. She said, oh, this is, a, this is a makeup fridge. And I said, it's just big enough for the milk and the muesli that uh, needs to be in there uh, for the morning. Um, but it is a makeup fridge. That's why it comes with the mirror and the light. Uh, but when you close the door, you can kind of shine it and uh, onto the bed and uh, read by the fridge light. Interesting, reading by fridge light. Now, as I said, we are currently in the egg stage. We are we are producing, producing, producing. Um, we have a, a new tool that creates a, a complete wrap now, um, nine foot wide. So again, we have to, when we ship it, we have to either cut it open on the bottom and, and uh, nest them into each other as Russian dolls, uh, dolls, or we have a system where we um, stand, them, stand them sideways so that we don't get into this issue of having a special transport uh, when it gets shipped. Uh, currently coming out of Toronto, Canada, uh, but we're not in the, in the mass production stage yet. We're only in the prototype stage right now. Um, and, uh, you know, having, we, we have all kinds of different versions of this uh, we're working on. There was a very good possibility of working on uh, 33 homes for the, uh, the town of Huron in California. But uh, uh, Mike from Western Fiber, who does make hemp insulation, and hemp is ultimately the, the, the ultimate insulation as well that I haven't mentioned before. Uh, but I'm, I'm waiting on Mike from Western Fiber in Oklahoma to give me the green light to say he wants to get some shipment of prefabricated boxes. Um, so making small houses for migrant farmers, that's the intent in, in the town of Huron um, in California. Stackable, uh, we have a solution for stackable. There's a, there's a stair backpack that can be fitted to the back of these houses. And uh, as we have a fairly good structure, it uh, it can just hang off the top unit. And that's the the inside view. Everything made from the same material. a lot of uh, a lot of that material. Uh, we've done we've done all kinds of things. We've done furniture. We like one day the boss came in and said, let's try to make a bicycle. We've made a bicycle out of this material. Um, non-steering, so it's a straight like a straight bike. you can a walking bike. Um, but uh, it is an interesting material, and uh, we are, trying to see how we can push that onto the market. Now, as a, as a designer, as a, and I, I, I call this kind of materials and methods, and uh, I have been teaching materials and methods. I, I have been teaching Japanese joinery at university level, wood shop, but uh, sustainable practices as well. So it was a, a beautiful moment to uh, work together with someone um, from the tiny home community to uh, finish her school bus uh, just recently. Um, I think it is almost finished. It's not totally finished yet. I'm up in Quebec, so I don't know if it's completely finished now. But uh, it was a pleasure to uh, to work on something like that. And I think it's all in the same line, whether it's a school bus, whether it's a tiny home, whether it's a um, um, whether it's a camper van, uh, whether it's a, a a Ram or Mercedes Sprinter van that you're converting. Um, all of these are with the vision of autonomy, trying to be your own, trying to evade some of the rules and regulations that exist. I like to keep my structures at the 10 or the uh, 10 square meters, 15 square meters, 20 square meters in some jurisdictions so that I can evade these situations. Um, in combination with permaculture, like if you have a small plot of land and you have something where you don't need a permit, that is absolutely ideal. Um, just as, uh, as Patrick in the first presentation was saying, there's less jurisdiction in South America 
I mean, here in Quebec, in the in small towns, you are allowed to have three chickens. Maybe in South America, nobody cares if you have uh, fifteen chickens and a rooster. But here, we're not allowed to have roosters. We're only allowed to have chickens. Um, so building the school bus was really beautiful. Um, and all of these things, all of these uh, vehicles, on wheels, off wheels, they all all share the same principles of um, uh, figuring out how you get uh, propane into it, um, how to heat things, how to have water connections, permanent water connections, um, how to have permanent electrical connections, or make your own power with uh, solar panels, have your shower facilities, um, this is, uh, I, I don't have a picture. I, I, I didn't have the perfect picture to show, but a life edge counter. Um, and there's, you know, whenever you built, whenever you build tiny homes, whenever you build a school bus or a van or, or something in your backyard, you got to be kind of realizing, oh, you know, I'm not level. So the, the van isn't standing level. So it's, sometimes it's really hard to establish. And we, we went off the wheel wells too late realized the wheel wells were actually not level. <laughs> they slope a little bit to the back. Um, so certain things, you know, you you, you work with, you play with. Um, uh, Joyce, who's the owner of this bus, um, very sustainable and environmentally conscious. She put in wool insulation, very, very beautiful. Um, and uh, there went off the wheel well and uh, we, we installed this life edge counter which also becomes we 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 cut the uh, the sink out and the life edge. I don't have a picture of it, but the cutout becomes a cutting board on the sink, and the life edge kind of leaves a little gap so that you can scrape your food leftovers into the sink. Like tiny little things that you, you know, you you create while working, and everything is a is a yes. Joyce <laughs> Joyce works with Acorn Tiny Homes, of course. She's awesome. <laughs> Uh, awesome to see her schoolie here. Yeah, it is. It is. It was a pleasure working with Joyce and uh, Darcy, who will present later on. Will uh, he's currently working with Joyce uh, on on a tiny home. So it's a very small small knit uh, community, and I hope to meet uh, the people from Fritz as well. Now, um, like everything, like I I love challenges. I love to um, like if there's a challenge, if there is a if there is a problem. There's a solution. It's nothing is impossible. We just have to think about it carefully and make it happen. Um, school buses have constant issues with that automatic door. And I've seen some people put big blocks of wood over it uh, in order to make it lockable because it is a weak spot. Um, it does is a, a small weak spot. Um, so together with Joyce and, and uh, myself, we we managed to create a, a beautiful lock system for that existing door that uh, uses a deadbolt, a standard available deadbolt at the hardware store. And um, it uh, it ended up being, let me just play this. And I, no, I wasn't sure if I have the sound on it, but it's very satisfying to see this close and actually you know, work. And people then be able to unlock it, lock it. So it is it is uh, tricky. As I was drilling the outside, I, I did not know if I'm going to break the glass or not. Um, luckily, I didn't. And I was quite uh, fortunate to see that it was a solid uh, metal profile. Um, we actually want to, we almost want to put this on, a, on, a, on YouTube to, uh, to show other people how to make that lock because I've seen so many options of locks and this seems to be a beautiful version. Uh, the rubber lip is still very soft, and uh, I basically got around that by inserting a piece of aluminum from the top, a flat bar aluminum, and then screwing it into the lock mechanism. And with that, the lip became solid. Um, of course, the lip is soft so that if a kid puts their, their hand there, it will not get crushed under no circumstances. So there's a lot of play in that lip. But that's also the downside. Uh, the complete downside of uh, of school buses when it comes to safety that, you know, you might be sleeping in there and somebody can basically open the door and reach inside. Um, so being mobile um, is, uh, it comes with, uh, with pros and cons. And here's the heater as well that um, you can use as a gas heater, propane, or as an electric heater, very small heaters under sink that will provide you hot water. And uh, this school bus is, uh, so this shows the, the uh, Joyce's school bus on the inside. 
in the early stage of the plumbing phase where we have to pump the, the accumulator, the tank, um, drainage, it's um, the drainage from the shower or from the sink. Um, it all depends how you're going to do um, and where you are. Um, sometimes you can have these ready-made uh, units that you just slide under your, your bus and um, it fills. And then when it comes time to empty it, you, you can empty it somewhere if you want to be completely hygienic. Um, compost toilets are, of course, there. All kinds of different compost toilets do exist from simple homemade boxes, from the Home Depot bucket with a ring on top. I think that ring is available at uh, at the hardware stores, Rose, Lona, Rona, Home Depot, all of these stores sell these rings that you can put on a bucket. Um, and ultimately, this compost toilet is also the ideal um, toilet that you can use if you don't have a structure that requires a permit, because a compost toilet is not um, a piece of plumbing. So you can get away with having a compost toilet in a non-certified, non-permitted small structure. There's always, like when I teach, I always uh, tell my students, please ask me questions that I cannot answer. Um, and uh, one of my one one of my most amazing students, and I should come to an end very soon here, so that there's time for Q and A. But uh, one of my most amazing students then asked, um, "Can you build uh, ten square meter or hundred square foot units right next to each other, um, or how far away do they have to be?" And I actually at the time didn't know um, the answer. Um, so he really caught me, and he finally had a question that I could not answer about um, um, all of this construction. Um, and construction technology. Uh, so looking it up, it actually there is the um, um, there is the issue of how far away these units are. So if you have a large property, I think ten percent, five percent, depending on your zoning bylaws, you can build on. And if you have these tiny structures without plumbing, so just a garden hose connection, um, then compost toilet in there, you can actually have a couple of units three meters, 10 feet apart, and nobody can tell you anything. Um, nobody can tell you you cannot do this. So trying to find uh, 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 in Ontario, they can't be attached to another building. Correct, correct. They have to be separated by three meters by Ontario building code. Um, and then the question is what, you, what to do with the compost. It is, um, there, there is, many things that you can do with the compost. You can actually, you can use the compost, you can create methane and then use the methane back into your into your unit to uh, create hot water, for example. Um, you can compost it to the point where you can put it back into your permaculture uh, situation. Um, you can get rid of it in, in uh, local compost facilities. There's many ways. Um, and uh, I think when you look at all of these different toilets that do exist, uh, of course, there's the one that, you know, you just poo in and you close it, but that's kind of avoiding the responsibility. So I, I don't necessarily think that's the, the right way to, to do it. It's a, it, it's like a, it's a, it's a quick, cheap, uh, cheap way of getting rid of the, the waste. But I think to, to do it right, you know, use the coconut, uh, and, and, uh, uh sawdust, um, and compost it properly. It is, of course, way more work, but um, it is the right way. And just like a, like a van, you know, um, whether it's a, how, how you want to, you know, spend your time in, in, in nature, in, in total autonomy, um, that is your choice. I mean, there's incredible ready-made things. The Airstream is, you know, ultimately a dream, <laughs> um, $100,000 dream. Um, but you also need a vehicle to tow it. That's going to cost you <laughs> a lot of money as well. Ice cream trucks, tiny homes, building your own. Um, and ultimately, I do teach all of that in, in six-week courses um, with the Canadian Centre for Learning. So a little bit of advertisement, not so much advertisement for my ready-made structures yet because we're not there yet. Um, <laughs> Darcy, you're looking out at Joyce's bus right now. Yes, it's in your, it's on your property. I know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, anyways, thank you very much. And as I would love to have a nice background behind me, I, I, it would have been nice to go into my car and just drive, uh, you know, five minutes down the hill, 
and uh, show you this. But um, anyways, it's the opposite of uh, South America. It is very cold out there right now. We just had a we just had a two foot, three foot snowstorm, uh, but it's beautiful. And I will get back out there again and look for the seals. Apparently the seals are out on the ice. Um, now, one, one thing that's so beautiful about being in the middle of nowhere or almost close to the Arctic Circle, I do appreciate um, indigenous knowledge that we have up here. Um, I didn't do my land claim before I started this, uh, this presentation. Um, but I'm very appreciative of the knowledge that I have gained from the indigenous cultures up here. The, like, there could be ice and snow, but you can find food and you can buy, you can find incredible herbs and incredible nutrition up here. And uh, that's something that if I'm not going into small home design, I will, will definitely um, I will definitely go into uh, herbal medicine because the herbs, you know, you got to imagine a herb that uh, has to, or a plant that has to survive on a, on a rock surface for uh, maybe four months of ice. That's a very potent plant. And uh, the indigenous cultures up here, they know which plant to eat and which plant to not to eat. And it's always an, an amazing pleasure to be walking through um, snow and ice or some some forest um, and being told this you can eat try it and it's amazingly good all right thank you all right uh, to the questions um, price range well we are we are really trying to be in the and, and uh, if you're from the US, you're always at the benefit, right? If we're in the $50,000 range for a 10 square meter hut um, or a 150 square meter hut, I think we can still kind of make it 50 to 60,000 um, Canadian. There will be shipping costs. Um, and being in Canada, uh, we, we definitely, like, depending on where you are, of course, you know, working with the town of Huron in California, it would be an honor to to have our houses there, but I do know it's an incredibly long trek and journey. We're looking at trucking options. We do know if we're nine foot wide, we need a special escort. It's going to be very exp expensive. So we're looking at alternatives, but I, I think price range, we we will be in the fifty to 60,000 Canadian. So for you in the US, you do have the benefit that you only have to pay whatever, $48,000, uh, $45,000 US um, plus shipping. That will be, of course, a little bit more getting into the US. Taxes and duty is always a tricky one, very, very tricky one. Um, but uh, yeah, um, if, you, if you're interested in the course, uh, Canadian Center for Learning, .ca, and center spelled the British or the, the Canadian way, R-E. All right, any other questions? And I'm happy to uh, promote, um, yeah, thanks, thanks for posting that. I'm happy to promote and have somebody come up here too and uh, assist me up here. Um, it is, uh, it, there, there's something to be said about, you know, being, being somewhere and not even having, not even, even having electrical lines on the street. <laughs> Um, like you're really close to uh, to nowhere. Um, one morning, driving in the van, I, I woke up and uh, come to the water, and I didn't get my camera ready on time. There was a fox standing right in front of me. It was such a beautiful moment, um, you know, to being so close to wildlife. I I've seen black bears, um, you know, coming out of the out of the bushes and. Uh, first I thought it's a big dog but no it was a black bear <laughs> um, so it's uh, it's beautiful to be to be out here and being alone when you take a photograph and you know there's nobody in the in the next uh, yes investment opportunities land is cheap up here contact me um, I'll set you up um, there is investment opportunities sure um, if you or if you want to invest in our company definitely please get in contact with me uh, my website is up there. My my connection, um, either either info or Mark at t dash yyz dot ca, uh, gets you to me. 
Lots of black bears in New Jersey, yes. Beautiful creatures, and so are foxes. And foxes are, are such amazing creatures, um, such beautiful and smart animals, very, very smart animals. Uh, very hard to capture in a photograph. I wish I had my camera ready. Would have looked right at me in, in one of the most beautiful um, geographic uh, settings. Absolutely, sounds amazing. Good, good. Well, yeah, thanks so much, Mark. We appreciate uh, the presentation that you gave. Super well-rounded understanding of what you're up to, but also just a good uh, kind of experience in the um, like build, building science and the different ways to build and your uh, your metal Velcro, like you're calling it more or less, whatever your specific term is for it. That's super cool. I love that you basically can press the panels in almost any shape that you're looking for. I think that that's a uh, yeah, it's incredible. I was wondering how you're able to make those uh, pictures and whatnot, but or the actual structures and the shapes that they're in and uh, like that makes sense now. But yeah, uh, I want to see that up closer. Do you are you able to show us again? I know it would be nice to see like this is the this is the uncompressed sandwich, you know, just like okay. a, a bunch of Oreo or whatever, you know, that's your Oreo sandwich, your 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 ice cream sandwich, yep. <laughs> but okay. it's not pressed. And uh, individual um, layers inside here is the yeah. uh, the metal. Mm, focus, focus, focus there. So it's micro hairs. It's very, very sharp. Yeah, we have okay. so many injuries. <laughs> always band aids. Always band aids. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it is hard. Um, and then the the finished panel. You know, it's it's absolutely absolutely rigid. Um, cool. Insanely strong. Um, this is a this is a very high end. Uh, thermally disconnected Swiss connector. I shouldn't have the uh, I shouldn't have the the fuzziness of the camera there. That's right, no worries. But um, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful technology and uh, we're we're pushing it uh, having a couple of patents on it. Uh, mostly the company that I work with has a bunch of patents on it. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, quite amazing that we were able to pay off uh, 3M with a one-time payment which is very rare and unheard of. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's awesome, yeah. Typically, that's... they want royalties. Yeah, seriously, yeah, they want to take it for all your worth. It makes sense, but um, that's awesome. Yeah, so that way you guys can actually use that, and that's amazing. I remember you showing us renders. It must have been probably two or three years ago, something like that, of that exact structure that you just showed us, the 10-meter-squared uh, unit. and. Right. And seeing it come to life is is amazing. I love even just the square box that you guys have made and you turn it into an actual like living home, living a tiny house, basically. It's amazing. So great job there. And it's really cool to see the pictures of it. And I'm excited to follow along your journey and what you're going to come up with next and everything. We'll stay in contact. As soon as I have the prototypes, I will definitely uh, uh, spread uh, spread them. Yep, absolutely. Good go. Um, well, yeah, there's an interesting question right now. Sorry to interrupt. I was going to say the same thing that there's a question that popped in. So, how to avoid the tiny home to get too hot in the summer? Um, in case you want to have a lot of windows, light coming in, can you transfer the heat to the ground during the day and save it for the use of the electric device? Okay. Um, yeah, there's a couple of things in there. There's there's a lot of things that are possible. Um, Shading is number one. Um, trees are, of course, amazing. If you park your tiny home under trees, you've got the best of both worlds, uh, especially if they're uh, deciduous trees, because they, in the winter, you get the solar heat gain, and in the summer, you get the shading. So trees are very good. Um, there is a lot of people who also put uh, canopies. I've seen you know, Airstream, contain, uh, Airstream trailers, for example, being parked under, under a canopy. Um, if you are in in Arizona or somewhere, it, the the airstream contain uh, the airstream trailer is actually uh, one of the most amazing trailers to be in. If you've ever been inside one, it is absolutely amazing. Uh, you can be in another RV and it's hot, and the uh, uh, the airstream is actually fairly cool because of the round um, nature and of the highly reflective uh, surface of the aluminum. So shading is definitely a good thing to do. You can shade your windows, make it an active house so that you actually physically have to pull out some shades. Um, if you are in Italy, 
um, everybody has shutters and in the it's siesta and all the shutters close. You know, you you the the height of the sun, you close everything and make sure no no heat comes in. So preventing the heat from coming in um, for the windows is absolutely important. Now, if you if you prevent the heat from coming in in the windows with solar panels, like you're closing it with solar panels, that's the ideal because then you can actually create electricity um, at the same time. Um, and heat transfer, if you have evacuated tubes, for example, you as, as I mentioned before, you can actually create a copper coil in the ground. You can send the energy into the ground. Of course, you need machinery to, to drill and dig. Um, a lot of stuff that you can do without machinery and, and actually um there is you know there's ways of taking a just a pvc pipe and cutting some teeth into it and putting a, a rod around it and you can actually drill your own small tiny well like you, there's a lot of things we can do um with with small things without machinery but in order to put a seasonal energy storage in the ground you do need a backhoe to dig some serious hole and put some copper um inside the ground um you're, you're still seeing the ice and road screen yeah yeah sorry um i i don't know if i have uh i i could go back to the to the previous slide if i can get there fast enough but um yeah there is uh there is ways of um sustainably um working with what you have depending on which part of the world you're in and uh, ultimately learning from the animals you know, shading from the from the sun is crucial. Uh, yeah, this 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 image is probably one one image where you can store um, the energy that you're producing from the evacuated tubes underground in seasonal storage, and then pulling it back in the winter. Now, certain things will work; certain things will not work. Like being in Canada and having having a very long winter like three four five months depending on where you are um, of frost um, of course there is a limit to it and you will not be able to use all of these technologies you will always have to have a backup um, so and but backup in canada is so easy you just have a tiny little wood stove as a backup for the winter and there is incredibly beautiful tiny little clean burning wood stoves that do exist that you could use anywhere Everything is always a story. There's always extra things to concern about or think about. As soon as you put a wood stove into a passive house, though, you got to watch out that you don't uh, get carbon monoxide uh, built up. Um, so you you got to be um, making you know critical decisions of, uh, of uh, critical thinking is required in order to um, to make all of those things happen. But uh, yeah. nothing is impossible. Yeah, it's true. All right. Well, Mark, thank you so much. It's 11 and I got to get to the next uh, next presenter right. here, but we really, really right. appreciate your time. Thanks for sharing so much uh, great information here. So awesome. Appreciate it. And we'll be in touch for sure. Perfect. All right. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.